Hi, I'm Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our Facebook Live. Today is actually our last Facebook Live in the month of August. So, hope you've had a great summer. I kind of feel like I'm, I got to go pack and go back to school. I spent all those years working the Catskills, and I would finish up Labor Day weekend. Then I would drive home from upstate New York, seven hours, to Baltimore, and then I would go to college. So, I forgot, then I was worrying the other day, I woke up, oh my God, I forgot to register for college. <laughs> okay, enough of that. Anyway, um, so hopefully everybody's enjoying this transition from, uh, it actually was cool in Baltimore this morning, it was 60 degrees, I think it gets up to the 70, so hopefully those days of 90 and 100 are, um, are not a problem. Uh, global warming is no longer here, uh, at least for this week. Uh, anyway, this talk is on small bowel, and I thought I would speak to you a little bit about um, the small bowel optimizing protocols and some of the things we know. Now, I think small bowel is one of the most difficult areas, and especially when you relate to small bowel tumors, and there are some talks on CT as us on small bowel tumors. I think it's very easy to miss small bowel tumors. I think it's very easy to... Uh, that it's very easy to um, pick up small bowel tumors if you have really good protocols. Now, I think in terms of detecting lesions, and when you think about it, small bowel tumors are increasing. There's four types, adenocarcinoma, gist tumors, carcinoids, lymphoma, but especially gist tumors and adenocas are increasing with gist increasing fourfold over the past 30 years. Now, in saying that, the problem with small bowel in general, particularly on the tumor side, is patients present with very nonspecific complaints. It may just be the general abdominal pain, some weight loss, some bloating. And it's very hard to pick up small bowel tumors. Uh, remember their articles, presentation to detection six to 18 months. We wanna minimize that. Now, one problem is clinicians often don't send patients for CT. So that can be an issue. But I often see things that are missed. So what do you need to do with a small bowel? The key to small bowel imaging is good distension, but really good IV contrast enhancement. Because most of the tumors, for better or worse, do enhance. And even if they don't enhance, you see transitions in the bowel. It may be a small polypoid lesion. I just looked at a great case today of a duodenal tumor where it was really hard to see, and I knew it was positive because they already had endoscopy, it was almost two centimeters. When I did the cinematic rendering, it showed really well. So how you look at things become critical. I find that multiplanar is a minimum. 3D imaging, both on the MIP and volume rendering side, and now the cinematic side becomes very critical for looking at and detecting tumors. In terms of protocols, one could argue about positive versus neutral contrast agents. Particularly if you're thinking about GI bleeding, we use water as a neutral agent. That works very nicely. You could use volumen. You could theoretically use positive contrast, and positive contrast sometimes is really good uh, using oral omnipaque uh, for opacifying the bowel and showing you filling defects. So that can work really well. The key thing, of course, is the IV contrast as well. 100 to 120 cc's of Omni 350, Visi 320, injected at 5 cc's a second. Dual phase, arterial at 30 seconds, venous at 60 seconds. A lot of the tumors, particularly things like GIS, carcinoids, even adenocas, have some vascularity. GIS and carcinoid have a lot of vascularity. And so they may be only seen on that arterial phase, especially when they're small. So when you're looking at these small one centimeter lesions, that is really the critical time to be able to pick up those lesions. Now, sometimes I'll see them well in the venous phase and occasionally even better in the venous phase, but I love the arterial phase for picking up small lesions. When you have patients with GI bleeding, obviously the arterial phase usually is the best, though you need dual phase for doing uh, that as well. It's very important to recognize that the dual phase mapping is critical uh, in GI bleeding, and we talk about GI bleeding in colon, but also small bowel, and the one thing in evaluating small, in evaluating GI bleeding in general, I have picked up many small bowel tumors. Typically, they're just tumors. And we may pick up other things, angiodysplasia, things like that. But protocol <clears throat> is really, really critical in that regard. So 
um, that becomes very, very important. I mentioned the visualization. I like 0.75 millimeter thick sections every 0.5. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you have good overlap of the vessels. And when you do the reconstructions, there's no stair stepping or anything like that. So I like to do that. And then I reconstruct, I mentioned coronal. I also do sagittal because sagittal gives me a good look at the SMA, celiac, and IMA. And then what I do is I take that and do a volumetric approach, MIP imaging, slab MIP, looking for sites of increased vascularity, looking for transitions. Volume rendering is really good for transition. And cinematic rendering, I seem to be finding more tumors because within the bowel lumen, it does a very good um, lighting model, and you can pick up intraluminal masses. So I seem to like that as well. So I don't have really good numbers for you, but I'm going to try to put together an article. And I am putting together some stuff for CTSS on the small bowel tumors with cinematic rendering. We have published one article. I think Linda Chu or Steve Rowe is the first author. But I think we need to do, in fact, better than that. Now, in addition to tumors, obviously, Inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease is a good example. Uh, we look for the, the changes in bowel caliber. We can look for areas of obstruction, stenosis. We look for complications. We look for the presence of abscesses. We look for the presence of nodes. So again, looking at inflammatory bowel disease is very important. We look at bowel caliber things like sprue. In the patient in the acute setting, I saw a really good case a couple weeks ago patient with abdominal pain, had thickened bowel, lots of fluid in the bowel, a typical summer thing where a patient ate something at a picnic, and you develop uh, infectious processes like salmonella. So those are important as well. And again, uh, MR enterography is good, but I think CT enterography, particularly in the acute setting, is better. And we're able to define location, caliber change, and, and things like that that are very, very helpful uh, for us in looking at those patients. The um, patient's visualizations, again, even on inflammatory bowel disease, I love the coronal view. I love the MIP imaging for looking at the comb sign. I like um, the visualization. Now, I will say when you're looking at inflammatory bowel disease, for disease activity, water or other neutral agents are ideal, but I will say um, that if I'm looking for fistulas, you need positive contrast and you need to wait. It's very hard to detect and track fistulas from bowel, enteroenteric, maybe you can do okay, but uh, if you're looking at fistulas outside of bowel to various organs, abdominal wall, and the like, it's really positive contrast that becomes very, very critical to me to be able to visualize those fistulas. I think without the positive, you tend to see something going on, but you don't know if the fistulas are patent, you don't know what direction things are tracking. And so as you try to do surgical planning for the surgeon, they really want to know where the tracks are, not just seeing tracks, but is that track going into the rectus muscle, into the abdominal wall? What do they expect to see? Those also become very important. We also talk about small bowel obstruction, and be it due to tumors, benign and malignant, be it due to inflammatory bowel disease, whatever it's due to, it really doesn't matter, right? And so the key thing in those scenarios is that when you're looking at inflammatory disease, when you're looking at tumors, when you're looking for transitions, the protocol is really critical. Now, I do know some people have spoken about positive contrast in that regard. But if you have small bowel obstruction, the contrast is going to take a lifetime to get there. And even if the patient can't drink any PO, if you have small bowel obstruction, a combination of fluid and air is like the best contrast agent. So we're able to track, we follow it down, and we look for transitions. I will say that axials are difficult. You kind of can say the bowel is distended, but it's showing the precise transition. It's really hard because when you're looking, you know, the bowel loops are going up and down and axials don't work all that well in that regard. That's where the coronals work real well. And again, the interactive sliding in and out, uh, cut plane uh, volume, maybe five to seven millimeters. I find that that works incredibly well. So 
That part I think I'm, I'm really excited about in doing that as well. Now, in terms of um, other things in small bowel, now looking at transitions, looking at things like intussusceptions, we're pretty good at that. You also want, again, in the, particularly in the scenario of bowel obstruction, looking for um, internal hernias. So you want to look at the enhancement of bowel. You want to look at where the bowel is going. Is there a herniation? Is there bands present? So sometimes patients have had prior surgery. They have a thin band like a piano wire, which causes obstruction, which causes transition. All of those things are very, very important. Now, you may not see the band, but you can see where it is, and then the surgeon can go in, cut the band, and then the patient who may have bowel, which may look a little dusky, will again re revascularize, and the patient will not need bowel resection. So that becomes a very important uh, aspect of things as well. I see Amar has logged on. Hey, Amar, I think he's taking his exams this week, so we wish him the best of luck. Um, we're about two-thirds of the way finished, so if you have specific questions, particularly on the uh, Facebook side of things, I'm looking at Instagram. I'm not sure how the questions come up on Instagram, but if you put it on Instagram, I see a lot of people want me to wave on Instagram, but I can press the buttons, but I'll probably shut Instagram off at the same time. So if you're getting the waving stuff, uh, um, if anyone has any questions to ask, now is a good time. Now, uh, what else can I tell you in terms of small bowel? Um, we do also look at um, bowel in terms of patients who've had surgery. So patients with Whipple's procedure, looking at gastrointestinal looking at patients who've had weight reduction surgery, looking at patients with a range of small bowel resections. Uh, when we look at small bowel, also I should comment, we look carefully at the mesentery. Carcinoid tumor, the thing you may see most is a mass in the mesentery, 70% of the time calcified, desmoplastic reaction, kind of finger-like projections, and this uh, tethering. You may also see the uh, bowel being tethered and pulled, and you may see that desmoplastic reaction encasing SMV or SMA. That's very classic for carcinoid tumor. When we see mesenteric masses, obviously there's a range of things that can give you mesenteric masses. Lymphoma can give you lots of nodes. A, des a desmoid tumor can be a big mesenteric mass. Now, with carcinoid, you have a mass, but three things that make it unique usually, it enhances. 70% of the strophic calcification and the finger-like projections or desmoplastic reaction. Desmoid tumors typically are smooth. Sclerosing mesenteritis is the one thing that I see in the mesentery at times that can have a mass that is calcified or at least partially calcified. Now I will admit with uh, sclerosing mesenteritis, usually I don't see that same desmoplastic reaction. The things are usually a little bit different. So I can usually do okay on when I'm, when I'm looking at those, and I don't typically see that same problem. Um, other mesenteric masses, you can have METS to the mesentery. I should mention that METS to the mesentery, METS to small bowel are more common these days. Sometimes you could recognize them. If you see a renal cell and a vascular lesion in the bowel, you know, that's a metastatic renal cell. Uh, the classic thing I do see now in melanomas they can be large METs, they can cause obstruction, they can cause GI bleeding, they can cause intussusception. So there's a number of things you can do and look at when you're thinking about that. So that indeed becomes very important as well. In, in this era where patients are doing much better on chemotherapy, we are seeing more small bowel metastasis. So maybe one thing I can caution you and remind you is when you're staging patients or restaging patients, be it renal cell, be it colon cancer, being lung cancer, look carefully at the small bowel. Look carefully at the mesentery. In the past, patients may not have lived long enough to get METs, but now we are seeing METs, and that may be the cause of the patient's symptoms. So it's very important to look really carefully at that area, and I try to do that in all cases. Um, other things in small bowel, polyposis syndromes, Things like that, I think we're okay. Small polyps can be difficult. We look at enhancement, things like angiodysplasia. And as I mentioned, small bowel bleeding. We're doing a lot of patients at Hopkins. CT is a study of choice for bleeding. And often you think about colon, but sometimes you see stomach, 
Sometimes you see small bowel. And we do see a lot of small bowel, especially tumors, though occasionally we will see AV malformations or angiodysplasia. So it's really a spectrum of things. So let's see, I'm past my 15 minutes now. Uh, this is a good time, I said, to raise your hand. Uh, if not, if you want more information, you can look at our teaching file. We've been adding a lot more cases. There's thousands of small bowel cases. If you want to listen to lectures, there's a number of lectures on CT as Us uh, on both the website as well as on iTunes, YouTube, and the Apple Store. And we are continuing to work on new material. And uh, with that, I'll stop there. And I thank Karen Hanks, who enjoyed this, but since no one's asking a question, and usually I get the questions after we hang up. So with that, I wish everybody a great day. I appreciate everyone coming on a Monday. Monday's kind of a difficult day. And oh yes, you may have seen on CTSS, we advertised our speaker series is starting. We have four incredible speakers in the fall. We'll have four incredible speakers in the winter, spring season as well. And if in the area, come on by. And with that, thank you for your attention. Have a great day.